Are there any things in, as you reflect on your career, that you would say you were disappointed in? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the, you know, I have been geographically limited. Uh, I guess in some absolute way, I could have run off <laughs> and gone and lived 2,000 miles away. But um, my options were limited by where my husband's position was. And, and the big limitation there is um, you, you, there are opportunities that you just don't take seriously. And then your own institution takes you for granted. They, they have a sense that you're not going to move. And they may even like you on one level, but there are pieces where, um, you know, presidents of university are pretty good about reading, you know. Um, and I was never able to put a bluff because I didn't have a bluff in me. Um, I, I also would say, and this is, this is like an intellectual disappointment, um, I have really mentored people to be the kind of researcher I always wanted to be. I have always been a scholar, but I wouldn't consider myself to be a researcher with a capital R. Even though I have run NIH institutional research training grants, gotten them and, and done that, and I've done research. But, but what I did, because I was, um, I think we're all stuck in our piece of time. And, and for me, if you can see where it's going, you just wish so bad that your piece of time wasn't as limited by what you had to deal with. But my piece of time was much more the theme of infrastructure. It was development. It was development of academic programs. It was development, say, in Sigma Theta Tau of, of organizationally, um, getting a, a, even a home of our own. Um, uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, I was the first uh, associate dean of research at my university. And if you had seen the first year of, of me being dean of research, I mean, I got nothing but banged up furniture for research assistants. I mean, believe me. <laughs> Um, I then wound up, you know, redoing the research center a couple of times and getting money for it. But, but a lot of the sort of developmental stuff I've done, but that I never got a program of research really established mm -hmm. the way then I have seen um, either my students or my colleagues go on to do. Mm -hmm. And so there's that twinge of, if I had only gotten a little more mentoring at the beginning, I think I could have amounted to something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, um, boy, I don't even know how to follow that up because you're such a great person and, and everybody has so much respect for you. But uh, let me ask you about Mary Stark Harper. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Stark Harper was generation or a little bit above you. And did you have contacts with her? Oh, yes, I did. Um, I was on the National Advisory Mental Health Council. I succeeded Claire Fagan on the National Advisory Mental Health Council. Uh, Claire, you were on the uh, committee for, what, four years? And I came on, like, um, 87 to 91. So you would have been there 83, yeah, to 87. And so um, the National Institute of Mental Health now is part of NIH. But at that time, there was a structure that was called ADAMHA, the, 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 so that mental health, drug abuse, and alcohol were in a separate structure. And that was the advisory board uh, that I was on. And Mary, of course, worked at NIMH. So I'm here to tell you uh, particularly for the, f 
I went on that board right after the National Center for Nursing Research had been created at NIH. And so my task as a board member was to help develop more comparable structures for site mental health nurses. Because at that time, they could not go to NIH for their grants. They had to go to Adamha. And Adamha, especially NIMH, was becoming much more, um, it was the decade of the brain, and mm -hmm. they were going much more for basic science. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was a sense in which uh, nursing uh, was even a little bit more behind given where they were going. And so one of the things I worked on for the four years I was on the board was to get some special research workshop. You know how the NIA does the summer workshops for aging? I was instrumental in getting something like that for psych mental health nursing, where people could go and they could present proposals and they would get help. I got money from them eventually. Um, for a state of the science conference on the decade of, how the decade of the brain was going to influence psych mental health nursing. I'm telling you what I was working on because Mary Stark Harper came to every board meeting and critiqued my behavior. <laughs> and you had to know Mary to understand um, that, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, she, she had such passion she cared so deeply. And it wasn't like an A, B, C, D kind of grading, but it was, uh, I like what you did there, Angela. You, know, you need to do a little bit more of that. You, you, know, you need to get together with so-and-so. Before the next meeting, we're going to do thus-and-so. And, um, and then I still remember, and Kitty's here, but I still remember when she pulled during that time, a psychogeriatric conference. She was just convinced we needed to move in that direction. And I, I, it was one of those things where whatever my assignment was, I, this was a little bit later, because I was already by that time dean. I remember uh, pathetically saying to Mary, but this isn't my area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary saying, no, but you're going to do it. And what I did then was the only right thing. I saluted Mary. Uh, <laughs> knew I was going to do it. And I actually partnered with somebody in my institution who was a colleague who actually was an expert. So together, you know, it was like I wasn't going to be embarrassed by my ignorance showing. But there are only two nurses I have known in a career where I've known a lot of people that um, Mary Stark Harper and Claire Fagan, you just don't argue. <laughs> you need to just salute and say, where do I show up? <laughs> um, now, both of them taught me an awful lot about leadership mm -hmm. because both of them are pushy broads, um, she says to Claire, um, because of the passion that they have. I mean, it isn't, it isn't personal. It isn't sort of like when they get an idea and they just want everybody to sign up for it. I, I really learn from both of them what is really the, the, the phenomenal power of passion. I learned this in fundraising. If you care deeply about something, even if you're awkward, but you care deeply and you will talk about it, even if people don't know what you're talking about, they respect the passion. They respect the fact that you um, were you, you you went to them, and and you were talking about something that was so important. And of course, uh, both Mary and, and Claire. I'm being deliberately a bit humorous in this. Both of them then were very eloquent. I mean, after they asked you and they got your agreement, <laughs> they were always very eloquent in the analysis of where you were going and what have you. But uh, uh, Mary, um, there is a mental health center uh, named after her. Um, she, she had interdisciplinary respect that, you know, if only one could, um, you know, bottle it, we would all want it with our diplomas. She, um, 
uh, she changed so much. She was at the Carter Center at the end, and really until the very, very end, um, uh, she was uh, constantly sort of putting forward, I don't know that she would see it, but I always saw her uh, putting forward ideas to see who would buy. It's like testing the waters, and if she saw somebody bought, then she would somehow go after them and, and work to put it together. She was an extraordinary mentor, too, uh, particularly interdisciplinary, because at NIMH, uh, there was not one field that did not feel her uh, encouragement 